privilege to have you join with us today. And I want to encourage you to invite one, to invest in someone's life, to share with them the joy of the Lord. This season is very difficult for many people. Those that are alone, lonely, some will be celebrating the first holiday season without a loved one or a family member. Or perhaps they're separated by distance from their families. And that invitation that you have to invest, that prayer, that word of encouragement that you have may mean the difference between somebody enjoying the holiday season or somebody mourning the time together. And I believe that God wants us to be light in our world. The light of the world, Jesus said that we were. And I want to encourage you in that. To our guests, we welcome you this morning. We're glad that you're here. Pray that you're made to feel welcome and that you've experienced the presence of the Lord here today because we are honored to have you with us. My friends, I've got a word for you today. I've got a word from the Lord. It's something that's been resonating within my spirit and my heart for about two months now. I've been sharing it with you for about a month, about four weeks, but it's been, it's been churning, burning, and cultivating within my heart. And it's a phrase that I know you're familiar with by now, but it's this. It's time to catch the fire. It's time to be ignited with the fire of the Holy Spirit within our life. It's time for the fire to burn within our heart and our spirit. It's time to walk in the fire of the Holy Spirit once again. Not to have an experience or not to relish the experience of the past, but embrace the fire of God today and in the future as well. For the fire of God did not come for a specific season or time, but the fire of God is for all time. Anything that God touches, he ignites. Anything that God touches, he will burn and build a fire within your heart. And I want to encourage you, for those of you that have been serving the Lord for a long, long time, first of all, let me say thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your maturity and for your onset of continuation in the Spirit of the Lord. But I want to speak to you for just one moment, and that is this. If you've been serving the Lord for a long time, it's time to find your first love again. When something becomes ordinary to us, when something becomes commonplace to us, we lose the fire. When our relationship with the Lord becomes common, when it becomes ordinary, when we forget what it was like when we first came to the Lord, that excitement, that enthusiasm, couldn't wait to open the Word, couldn't wait to worship God, couldn't wait to hear what the Spirit would say to us, and then over time, Occasionally, sometimes, we grow a little cold in our faith. Not that we don't love the Lord, not that we're not committed, but we're just, we let other things enter in as the Spirit directed us this morning. But I want you to know, if you've been serving the Lord for some time, it is time to reignite the fire in your spirit. And some of you have had, in the past, you've had ovens that had to be reignited. You have to be careful when you ignite an oven. We've had ovens in our home in the past where you had to turn on the stove and the gas would come on and then you had to light it. You had to be careful not to turn the gas on too long before you lit it or it'd singe your eyebrows. You'd walk away with being eyebrowless, if that's such a phrase. <laughs> and, and, and I think there are times where we have to reignite that fire within our own heart and it comes to us with a decision. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 6 tells us of an example of one of God's leaders catching fire, that is, seeing the fire and it having a pronounced and profound effect within his life. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 through 6 says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him, we're talking about Moses, in, a, in flames of fire. Oftentimes, God is reflected as a fire, a consuming fire. A refiner's fire. Many times the scripture refers to God and his spirit as a fire. On this occasion, Moses saw a bush. The Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Can I tell you, if God ignites a fire in your heart, it's not going to destroy you. It will refresh you. It will refine you you will experience something that you've never experienced before or perhaps have not experienced in some time. As I said last Sunday morning, it's time to dive deep, to go into the deep things of the Lord. The superficial things, the shallow things are good. And the scripture tells us that 
when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I acted like a child. But when I became a man, when I became an adult, when I matured, I put away the childish things. And my paraphrase would be, he put away the childish things and he dove deep into the things of God. And I want you to know, there's more of God for you to discover than you know to this day. And when you discover the goodness of the Lord, my friend, it is good. And it is refreshing in heart and spirit. So my word to you this morning, if there is a deep water of the Lord, if there's a deep spirit of the Lord, dive in this morning. Dive into the deep and immerse yourself into the glory of the Lord. I think sometimes religiously, we think that we will meet with the Lord when we gather together like this. And certainly we will. But this is not the only place I meet with the Lord. I meet with the Lord every single day. I experience the fire of God every single day. And by the way, when I go, wherever I go, I take the fire of God with me as well. It's an igniting of his fire. Psalms chapter 107 verse 24 says, They too observe the Lord's power in action, his impressive works in the deepest sea. The scripture says, if I go to the highest mountain, God is there. If I go to the valley, God is there. And if I go into the depths of the sea, God is there. And wherever the Lord is, his fire is there as well. A passion for the things of God. An igniting of purification and life that comes from the Lord. God's fire will not consume you to destroy you. God's fire will bring life to you in your spirit. It's, com it's time to commit to being all in. That's my challenge to you today. Get all in with God. Don't give him a portion of your life. Don't give him Sunday or Wednesday. Don't give him Bible study alone. Let it be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, walking and serving with the Most High God. And I'll assure you this, if you will walk with God, he will walk with you. And he'll be with you wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever you encounter in your life. As the Spirit spoke to us this morning, we don't let the things around us affect our life. We don't let the things around us bring a coals to the fire of God. In fact, when it gets difficult, we ought to turn to the fire of God. We ought to turn to the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's get all in today, and let's stay all in with God. But how do we do that? Well, if you weren't here last Sunday, I would encourage you to go back to our online service and watch the service. But let me just give you the steps that we took, four steps to igniting the fire of God, to diving deep in our spirit. Number one, you've got to develop a passion for the things of God. You've got to develop a passion. We all have passions. We, we have passions for different things. Some of us in this room today and online have a passion for work. We expend ourselves and our energy at work. My word to you today is let's get a passion for God today. And by the way, when you have a passion for God, he will meet that passion and he'll exceed that passion. Amen. Secondly, prepare the atmosphere for the presence of the Lord. Prepare our hearts, our mind, and our spirit for God to speak into our life, for God to reveal himself to us. For the only thing that will hinder God's revelation in our heart is us. God desires to. He wants to. It's his will to reveal himself to you every day. And, and, and I'll just tell you, God is creative in revealing himself. He does it in creative ways, not just the same time, same thing or same way all the time, not just through the preaching of the word, not just through music. Sometimes God, one day when I was a youth pastor, I was struggling over a message that I wanted to share and I was looking for an illustration. And, and so, and I was struggling, you know, sometimes, sometimes messages just flow. God just, the Holy Spirit just inspires and the message just flows. And, and when I'm typing it out, it just, it's just as though the Holy Spirit has just got a hold of my hands and just typing it out. And then there are other times where it's a little bit of a struggle. And I was struggling this day. And so I got in the car. I had an errand to run. And I got in my car to go to lunch. And I was driving down. And as I was driving down the street, I came to a stoplight at, at Fondren and Harwin. I came to a stoplight. It may have been Hillcroft. Nonetheless, doesn't matter. I stopped at a stoplight, and I looked over to a field, and there in the field was the exact illustration that I needed to bring the message to life. God is a creative God, and God can use anything to speak to us if we'll just have ears to hear. Thirdly, we've got to saturate ourselves in the Word of God. 
There is no excuse. There is no exception. There is no, there is no other way to know God other than to know his word. God reveals himself through his word. God speaks to us through his word. And if we're going to dive deep, if we're going to catch the fire, we've got to be people that are saturated in the word of God. We speak the word. We pray the word. We sing the word. We declare the word. The word is central focus in our heart and our life. And then finally, if we're going to dive deep and, and experience the fire of God within our life, we've got to commit to a place to put our full trust in the Lord, to fully trust God. We've got to be like Peter. When the Lord says, come, we've got to jump out of the boat, even though it may not make sense, even though intellectually the mind may say, that'll never work, it'll never happen. Can I tell you, many of the things that God will do in your life will not make sense. Did you hear me? Many things that God will require you to do will require faith that will defy intellect. I've had people in the church that were very intellectual, and that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's a, that's a good thing. Very intellectual. And, and I had one young man, he was, a, he was an attorney, and he came to me and he said, Pastor Steve, I'm struggling. I, I, I'm struggling with, with, with embracing the word. I, I'm struggling with obeying because it just doesn't make sense to me. And I said, brother, I want to tell you something. The things of God don't always make sense to us because God's mind is higher than our mind. Thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are different than ours. But if we're willing to take that step like Peter and jump out of the boat. Now let me, let me uh, caution you to this. Don't jump out of the boat if Jesus doesn't say come. <laughs> Has anyone had experience where you thought it was the voice of God but it wasn't and you sunk? I did. You're just not going to be honest with me. But I did. There are times where I jumped out of the boat because I wanted to, not because Jesus said come. I'm talking figuratively, of course. There are times that I took a step of what I thought was faith, and it wasn't faith, it was folly. But when Jesus says come, he'll take care of you. He'll sustain you, even though the mind says it can't be done. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. I want to tell you something. My God is not defined by human logic. And I praise God for that that his ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. We've got to exhaust ourselves. And I pray you get this this morning. We've got to literally exhaust ourselves in pursuit of God. The pursuit of the Lord has to be the highest priority of our life. The pursuit of the Lord has to take a priority over everything else in our life. But I assure you of this. If you will pursue God to that level, he will help you take care of everything else. If you pursue God and abandon everything but serving the Lord, committed to him in every way, he'll lead you on your job. He'll lead you in school. He'll help you in every aspect of your life. But given the highest priority is to serve the Lord. And my brother and sister, that's a decision we make every day. It's a daily decision. It's not a Sunday decision. And can I tell you, when you make that decision, I'm going to pursue God with everything that I have. I'm going to run after God as though there was nothing else in life, because after all, there is really nothing else in life. The devil will challenge you in that. The devil will tempt you in that. But when you stand in faith and stand in obedience to the Lord and you pursue God, you run after God with every passion that you have, I'll tell you two things. One, God will reveal himself to you. And secondly, God will take care of you as you have never experienced before. It's a decision every day. And when you've done that, when we commit to those things, something begins to happen in our life. Something that we long for. Something that we've experienced in the past. Something that we've heard of from others begins to be birthed within our heart when we commit ourselves to those ways. Something incredible happens when you catch fire. Something incredible happens when you catch the fire. And I'm going to share one with you that I think is important and vital. Something that happens when we begin to catch fire. Here's what happens. God will give you a new identity. God will give you a new identity. Names mean something. To some of you in your cultures, you, your names actually mean something. And i got to tell you, I love that. In fact, some of those names, some of your 
mothers and dads were believers and gave you a name that reaffirmed within you, planted the seed within you, and affirmed that within you over and over and over again. And I think that's wonderful. In the United States, we don't always know what our name means. Sometimes we don't have a clue. I asked, I've told you this before. I asked my mother and dad, why did you call me Steve or Stephen? Actually, my name is S-T-E-P-H-E-N. And how you get a V out of P-H, I have no clue. That's, that's English. Why did you name me Stephen? Dad said, we named you after a man in the Bible. And I was a little guy, and I thought, oh, wow, that is wonderful. Until I went and found out who Stephen was. <laughs> Stephen was the first martyr in the first century church. I got to tell you, I don't have a martyr complex. <laughs> but the fact that he stood for God is a blessing in my life. Amen. My wife's name is Donna. And that has a Latin origin, and it means lady. Can I tell you, my wife is a lady to the, to the very definition of the word. But my name comes from the Greek, and it means crowned and victorious. I didn't know my mother and dad knew exactly what I'd become. <laughs> I'm crowned with the glory of God. And I'm victorious through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But Don and I have other names as well. The first time we went to Nigeria, very first time, and it may have been the first Sunday that we were there or the first meeting that we attended to, the first leadership meeting, uh, they pulled Don aside and they gave her a Nigerian name. Her name is Mariachi. What did I say? Mariachi? <laughs> Ching, 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 ching. <laughs> Not mariachi. She could be that too, I think. Amarachi. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> Amarachi, which means the grace of God. Very first time. Didn't give me a name. Second time we went to Nigeria. Didn't give me a name. Third time we went to Nigeria, I went to Brother Chidi Okorafor, and I said, my brother, I've got a complaint for you. He got real serious. <laughs> I said, we've been to Nigeria several times, and I've never been given a Nigerian name. He said, we'll take care of that. <laughs> and during a service, man, they made a big, a big deal about it. And my name is, oh boy, <laughs> I, Ikechukwu. Got that right, Ikechukwu, which means the power of God. Now that goes right along with victorious, doesn't it? But then they gave me another word, another name. Chikuri, which means God is God or God exists. And I want to tell you something. I wouldn't be here today if God wasn't God. Amen. Those names mean something to us. They define us. And, and mom and dad, if, if you have children and you've named them a name that has a meaning, let them know what that meaning is and remind them of the heritage that God has placed within their life and heart. And if your children or born in the United States and they don't have a clue of what their name means, do a little research and find out what their name means. And you may have to rename them. <laughs> you, just, you really just don't know. If your name was Mariachi, you might want to change that name. <laughs> but names mean something. That's the message here this morning. Names mean something. And you know what? Many of us in our life, in our past, we have a history, and oftentimes that history defines us. There are people that have had things spoken over their life or things that have done to them that have literally defined them or at least affected their life in the past. So many have suffered a lifetime because of only one decision that they've made. I, I watch the news sometimes and I, I see people that are, have gone to court or have been tried and convicted and their whole life destroyed because of one decision that they made. One decision. And oftentimes, our whole lifetime can be defined by that one decision. Not only in a negative way, but in a positive way as well. A, a faith way. What we wouldn't do, some of us in this room or online this morning, what we wouldn't do if God would give us a do-over. Do you know what a do-over is? Oftentimes when we would play games as children and we got caught up in the game or 
or perhaps we were losing and we didn't like to lose, we would call do over, which means we start all over again. In the game of golf, it's called the mulligan, a mulligan. If you hit a bad shot and it, and it just goes awry, goes into the lake, goes into the woods, goes into the rough, rather than just taking an added stroke, you just say, mulligan, and that means you get another, another shot. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were given another shot at life? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could call out in that one decision that we failed in mulligan and we're able to just wipe it away and start all over again? Do over in that event, that thing that defined us, that hurt us, that caused us pain would just be washed away. We'd start all over again. A fresh start, a new beginning. Sometimes in our life, we encounter cruelty. And sometimes that cruelty is unimaginable. Cruelty can come at the hands or voice of children. Sometimes children can be most cruel, oftentimes not intending to be cruel, sometimes with intention. Friends can be cruel and hurtful. Even our family. Families can say things and do things that cause us great pain and harm in our life. And some of us in this room have experienced society creating those pains and suffering in our life. And oftentimes, occasionally, the consequence of those actions are a breaking of a person's will or a breaking of their spirit, something that they'll carry all of their life, something that they'll try to live down all of their existence and living it down to somebody who's not there, whose voice is only in their head or their mind, no longer present in their life. Unfortunately, our lives come with baggage. Things that we've done, things that have been done to us, failures we've committed, decisions that we've made, words that have been spoken over us, labels placed in our lives or the cruel actions of others. And too often, we allow those names to define who we are. Names like unwanted, liar, cheater, poor, ugly, fat, shy, dumb, or troublemaker, and any, other, any number of other names that could be mentioned. For some, we've carried one of those names with us since childhood. It's affected our life perhaps even affected our relationships with others. If your name is on that list this morning, I've got good news for you. When you catch the fire, you will never be the same again. When you catch the fire, you will no longer think of yourself as you once were, lost, condemned, a sinner, unrighteous, disobedient, rejected, carnal, or unclean. Isaiah spoke of this thing when he said, Forget the former things. Do not well dwell upon the past. And you know that sounds so easy. And when it comes to human ability, decision making, sometimes it is impossible. Sometimes the things that have been spoken over us, I call them unholy gifts. The things we didn't deserve, we didn't ask for, but they were thrust upon us. Sometimes those things last a long time and have a dire effect within our life. But Isaiah reminds us, when we catch the fire, we forget the past. We lay it aside, no longer allow it to define our life. When you surrender your life to Jesus, he will change who you are. But not only that, when you catch the fire, God will give you a new name. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? God will give you a new name. Amen. Revelations talks about that. In fact, one place in the Bible says it's a name that no one will know. It's a name that only God will define upon your life. In Matthew chapter 16, a story, and I don't have time to read it, but it's a story of, of Peter. And, and Peter was, he, he was a character, wasn't he? Peter was an absolute character. In one minute, he would, he would be bringing a revelation of who Jesus was, son of the living God. In the next minute, minute he's rebuking Jesus for something that was right. In one minute, he is walking in the glorious revelation of Christ, and the next minute, Jesus is saying, Satan, get behind me. That's Peter. But Jesus changed Peter's name. 
He changed. Simon, which was Peter's name to begin with, means the reed shaken by the wind. Doesn't that define Peter? Wherever the wind's blowing, that's where he's going. Whatever his emotion is in the, mo mo in the moment, that's what he's all about. But Jesus changed his name. He changed his name to Peter, which means the rock. Solid. Not bending towards the wind any longer. Not bending toward the will of man or even the, the, the carnality of Peter. But now Jesus declared, Peter, you are the rock. And upon that faith and upon that discipline of faith, Jesus said, I will build my church as a foundation. On the day of Pentecost, something happened to Peter. He caught fire, literal fire. And I want you to know, on the day of Pentecost, when the wind came, Peter was shaken by the wind that blew across that room. But the fire of the Holy Spirit transformed Peter's life. And in that moment, he truly became the rock that Jesus prophesied that he would be. When God changes your name, he will declare you have a new identity. You have a new destiny. You are no longer what you were. You're no longer who you were. But now you, you are who God declares that you are. Here's a couple of examples you find in the Bible. From Abram, which means high father, to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude of many nations, prophesying what Abraham would become. Sarah, meaning argumentative, to Sarah, which means the princess. But don't you know, if I had her first name, I'd want it changed as well. How would you like to be known as argumentative? Can I tell you? She probably was. But God changed her name. And her name became princess. Royalty in the house of God. What a transformation that is. From Jacob, meaning caught by the heel, which defined him at his birth, literally, to Israel, meaning God prevails and God prever preser preserves. From Joseph, meaning he will add, to Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Wouldn't it be a blessing to know whatever you were, a discourager, a negative person, when God builds that fire within your heart, no longer are you the negative of faith, but now you are a son of encouragement. When you catch fire, God gives you a new name. He gives you a new identity and he gives you a new destiny. And this will not be because of who you were or what you were capable of. It will not be because of what you didn't do or what you did. It won't be because of what others thought of you. Your name includes, and I want to share with you what your name is. You can leave this morning, know that at least these are a part of the name that God gives to you. No longer are you lost. Here are your new names. Here's what God declares your name to be. He declares your name to be masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. You're no longer the mess that you were. You're now the masterpiece in the hands of God. Ephesians 2.10 your new name will include adopted child of God. You're no longer a wanderer. You're no longer a pilgrim. You're no longer on your own. Now I am a child of God. And my brother and sister, he knows your name. He knows you as a parent would know the intimate details of a person's life. The Bible says he even knows the number of hairs on our head. You are a child of God. So that this morning we can declare, I am a masterpiece. Say it with me. I am a masterpiece. I am a child of God. Say it with me. I am a child of God. And your name includes that you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 17. All of the benefits of being a child of the King are yours through Jesus Christ. Every blessing that comes from that royalty and that royal lineage is now yours through Jesus Christ. You may have been a pauper before, but you're rich in, in faith now. Your new name is blessed. What's your name, son? My name's blessed. I am blessed of God. God calls me blessed. An abundance of every good thing that God has in store for your life. Your name includes light. Because Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You no longer live in darkness. Now you shine the brightness of God's radiance. 
Everywhere you go, every place you are, that fire radiates within your heart and spirit and people begin to see God within your life. And finally, you have a new name. and Your new name is forgiven. I am forgiven. I'm forgiven of those one de- that one decision I made that brought an identity that I am now ashamed of. That word forgiven means that all of my past is gone, washed clean. There's an old song we used to say, there's a new name written down in heaven, and it's mine. <laughs> oh yes, it's mine. When you catch the fire, God gives you a new name. He gives you a new identity, and he gives you a new destiny. Psalms 138 verse 8 says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose. My paraphrase would, paraphrase would be, the Lord will fulfill his destiny for you, his steadfast love. Oh Lord, endure, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hand. And I assure you this morning, God will not forsake the work of his hand. Without responding, I wonder how many here this morning need to be reminded of your new name. Need to be reminded that God doesn't call you the old name. God doesn't call you what you were. God has a new name for you. And I pray that that catches fire in your heart and your spirit. I want everyone to stand. Everyone standing. I want to pray. I, I want to pray that today is a new day in your life. And if you're here this morning and you are battling with the demons of the past, I want you to know God has defeated the demons of the past. God has covered those old names, attitudes, that old destiny, he's covered it in the blood of Jesus. I want you to stretch forth your hands like this and offer. let me offer this word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I declare you have given everyone in this room a new name. And with that new name is a new destiny. And I pray, Father, that we'll receive it. And I pray, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus will wash everyone clean of their past. Every mind clean, refreshed with the fire of the Spirit that purifies from the past to where we are today in the newness of heart and spirit by Jesus. I pray, Father, that we will know that we are a masterpiece in the hands of the master potter, that we can declare we are children of the Most High God with all of the benefits that come with that royalty. We are forgiven. We are forgiven. And I pray today, Lord God, ignite that fire within everyone's heart today. And uh, Father, I pray, let the Spirit of the Lord breathe with upon each one, Lord God, a fresh anointing, a fresh life, a fresh vision, and a fresh destiny. And Father, we receive it by faith. And Heavenly Father, when the devil comes with his lies and deception, when the devil comes to remind us of who we are, we will remind him, I am a child of God. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we will move from this moment forward with a fire of the Holy Spirit burning within our heart and life. And Father, from today forward, we will never be the same again. And may the fire be ignited today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise offering this morning. I believe that we have the fire. Now it's ours to give fuel to the fire. Let God birth that fire within you today in the name of Jesus. You have a new destiny and a new calling. You may be seated. Live within that. Relish it. Rejoice in it. Glorify God in the work, the new work that he's doing in your life today. Our challenge today is catch the fire. I charge you today. As you've received that prayer, I charge you, accept your new identity in Jesus. When you think of your old life, cover it with what God has declared today in your life. Your new name will include the righteousness of God. Your new name will include God's masterpiece. You are redeemed, adopted child of God. You're an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And you are blessed. Say it with me. I am blessed. And you are the light everywhere you go, radiating the love, glory of Jesus Christ. And you are forgiven. Don't allow your past to influence or destroy or determine your future because God has determined today you are a child of the King. And be encouraged today that God loves you. 
and he has his best for you. If you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's the beginning of a new destiny. That's the beginning of a new name. That's the beginning of a new influence within your life. And it comes not with religion. It doesn't come with information. It doesn't come because of what we do. It comes because of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's not a holy, day, a holy day or a holiday. That's an everyday occurrence, a decision that we make. Lord, I surrender my life to you. Can I just tell you there are some of us that have ruined our lives. Some of us have destroyed our lives. But God, aren't you glad? But God gives us a new beginning. Not a, not a new chapter in an old book, but a new book. It's called the book of life. And that life abundant. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would invite you to offer a simple prayer. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. A simple prayer where you would simply ask God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me of the wrong that I've done. Forgive me of the decisions I've made. Forgive me for what I was in the past. Forgive me. The Bible says that God is faithful and just and he will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, to paraphrase, God will wash the old away and make everything new in your life. And it all begins in a personal a prayer, a simple prayer, confessing Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, how much faith do I have to have? Well, the Bible talks about the faith as small as a mustard seed. You see, it's not how much faith you have, it's where you place your faith. It's trust. Just trust Jesus. Take that step of faith, that first step. It may seem like a small step to you, but in terms of your past, it's a large leap of faith. And ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And he will. He promised that he would. Today does not have to be the end. And it doesn't have to be the continuation of the old, a brand new life. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, it begins by saying, we've been given a brand new life and we have everything to live for. A charge to each and every one of us this morning in this room and online. Releasing the authentic fire of God in your life will empower you to make your life count. And when we catch the fire, my brother and sister, our destiny is to make our life count. God will make our life count. You'll be that authentic fire everywhere you go, in your school, your neighborhood, your job, with your friends. And as we prayed a moment ago, by faith, According to God's word, I release the fire of God in your spirit and life today in Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen? amen? We praise the Lord and glorify him that the fire doesn't come because of who we are. It comes by the will of God and the purpose of God. And I receive that fire in my heart today and I give fuel to it to grow in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord.